My name is Jan Harzan. I'm the executive director for MUFON. We are a scientific research organization that basically collects sighting reports from the public and then goes and investigates them. Our mission statement as an organization is the scientific study of UFOs for the benefit of humanity. And we have three primary goals. We investigate UFO reports, we promote research into the UFO subject, and we educate the public on our findings. The lecture is based on a hypothesis, so this is somewhat subjective and it's disputed among traditional archaeologists, what I'm going to discuss. Uh, but the, the premise of my lecture is that the Great Pyramid is a temple of initiation from a much older uh, civilization, uh, perhaps Atlantis. Uh, Lemuria was probably in the Pacific, but anyway, the premise of the lecture is that the Great Pyramid and most likely the Sphinx were from this uh, older civilization, at least uh, 10,500 BC uh, as the construction. So it's either 12,000 years old, or if you go back another precession of the equinoxes, there's a chance that the Great Pyramid is actually um, uh, let's see, 24 and, and uh, it's 36, it's either 12,000 years old or 36,000 years old. Uh, there's two possibilities. But um, so I want to make sure everyone knows this is a hypothesis and it's my opinion um, that it's the Great Pyramid, Great Pyramid uh, is a temple built for initiation for spiritual purposes and not the tomb of the Pharaoh. And I'll go over some reasoning there is some logic behind this. Uh, but briefly, some of the other people that adhere to this philosophy, uh, you've probably heard of Edgar Cayce, um, Graham Hancock, Robert Boval, uh, Ruth Montgomery, um, Madame Blavatsky of the Theosophical Society, um, that's earlier in the 20th century, the Order of the Golden Dawn, um, Aleister Crowley, um, Paul Brunton, uh, Gurdjieff, Rudolf Steiner. These are some of the people that also believed in the theory that the Great Pyramid is a temple for initiation and not the tomb of the Pharaoh Chaos. And uh, this field trip, uh, or the lecture is also based on my personal experience. I visited and spent time. Some of the pictures are my own pictures, and I gotta admit, some are off the internet. This is a picture I took. I was there for six weeks in Egypt in 1976 and 77. Uh, I spent four weeks at the Giza Plateau uh, doing some uh, archeological research. And I was also there with my spiritual teacher uh, who taught me a particular form of meditation. Uh, it's based on sound and light meditation. Uh, she learned, she spent several years in northern India in an ashram in the Punjab region. Uh, uh, was her teaching, or that's where she got her teaching. But I was on this uh, journey with her. And so she also believes that the pyramid is, is a temple of initiation as well. Uh, so I'm trying to get a, give a bit of the background that there's some other scholars that believe in this hypothesis and there's a lot of traditional archeologists that do not. The, the fella, you see him on the History Channel, Zawi Hawass, the chief Egyptian archeologist of the pyramids, uh, he doesn't believe in this at all. So <laughs> there's a major scholarly dispute about this and there's maybe 90% of traditional archaeologists believe the other way, that it's just a tomb, and maybe 10% of academics, whomever, believe in this premise. So I, I do want to you know, put a big asterisk here that this is a hypothesis, and I try not to be overly fanatic about it, but I do believe in it. This is just during the day. This is the Great Pyramid. It is approximately uh, 440 feet high. Um, it's at least two or 300 feet along each base. That's about a 40-story building. Uh, the blocks, um, they, they weigh anywhere five to 20 tons. Uh, the ones on the inside, the ones on the outside are, are maybe five to eight tons. The ones on the inside can be up to 50 or 75 tons. 
I did have some experiences and um, part of my revelation uh, is that after hours, uh, and I recommend this to anyone that visits the Great Pyramid, is that uh, the, the entrance is approximately here. Um, and also the, uh, the original limestone casing has been taken off. So what you're seeing is um, unfortunately uh, the Arabs in their Islamic crusade in the 1100s decided to just take off. They didn't want to quarry the stones for the mosques in Cairo. They didn't feel like going to a quarry, so they took the stones off these pyramids at Giza to build the mosques in Cairo. So they basically, uh, how to be diplomatic about this, they, they, they really destroyed part of ancient Egyptian heritage by taking the stones, the casing stones off and building the mosques. That's their karma, whatever. Uh, but that's why you see it in this state. Um, <clears throat> Uh, I did spend time, my point is I bribed the guards, and I do this a lot at archaeological sites, is if you go there after hours, when the tourists are inside, you can't meditate or have some private time to get the ambiance or the sacred uh, essence of the place. Uh, there's a philosopher, Mircea uh, Eliad, I'm probably mispronouncing his name, but he talks about the power of place, the power of, of sacred places, what they imbue when we spend time there, how they enrich us. So anyway, I spent time inside the Great Pyramid, like 6 o'clock to 8 o'clock at night. I bribed the guard, 10 bucks, this is in 1976, to spend time inside alone. And I also climbed, um, one night at 3 in the morning, I climbed up the uh, edges here. And if, if you ever climb up, you have to do it in the evening and now there's a lot more guards. When I was there, there was only two guards at night with rifles. And what I had to do was um, I had to wait until the guards, like, like there's some rocks you can hide here. And I had to wait till the guard went around this side and the other guard went around that side. And then I, at night, I'd, I'd climb up here. And when they came back around, I'd kind of hide here. And then they'd go back around the other side and then I'd climb up a little more, et cetera. And yeah, it's the way to do it. <laughs> but if, if you ever climb the Great Pyramid, and believe it or not, my great grandmother actually did on a trip. I couldn't believe it. I, she did in the 1890s. She visited the Great Pyramid with my great grandfather. And if you ever climb, make sure you go up the edges at the corners. Don't go up the center of the face. It's very dangerous. There's a lot of rubble here. And you can climb here. It takes almost an hour because you're climbing a 40 story building. And you can't just step up like this. You have to kind of crawl and lift yourself up. It's, it's doable. Um, but anyway, at, 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 I got up there about 4 in the morning to meditate. And then the sun came up. And I don't have a slide of it. But what was really amazing, well, it was really a rush meditating alone at the top of the Great Pyramid. And it was a starry night in the winter. Um, it was right after Christmas. Anyway, the stars were incredible. But when the sun came up, it casts a shadow immediately across the desert. And it, it goes in, in 30 seconds, it goes from no shadow to a, a shadow about 10 miles long. And it's the most amazing thing to watch. Um, but it was a beautiful experience meditating at the top and meditating inside. Uh, I'll talk about the inside in a bit. Uh, what happened was I came down about 8 in the morning and the guards catch you. because. <laughs> Uh, and they either arrest you or they put their hands out and say bakshish and you got to give them money so you don't get arrested. So they, they catch you coming down and you got to make sure it was 10 bucks. Anyway, uh, so next slide. These, these are the three together. Uh, a lot of people mistake this one's uh, Cheops, Kefren, Makarnos. These two, in my opinion, are from uh, the pharaonic uh, period of ancient Egypt, which starts around 3000 BC. Cheops uh, is over here. Um, it's also missing the cap, about 10 or 20 feet it's missing. You can see some of the original uh, capstones on Kefren right here. This is the way all three pyramids looked. Was these, when you, and I climbed up to the edge here uh, to one night. I also climbed on the top of this one another night. Uh, but these are really smooth uh, pieces of limestone. 
But these, these uh, the archaeologists date this about 2850 BC, this about 2800 BC, and this about 2750 BC, because this is supposedly Cheops, and then the son Kephren, then the grandson Makarnos. But my opinion is that these two are from Pharaonic, from that time period, and the Great Pyramid, again, is, and I'll give you some architectural evidence. Uh, okay, these, these are some just interesting uh, shots you get during uh, sunset. There are some astronomical alignments. The, the Sphinx is aligned pretty much, uh, it's almost facing more of Kephren, uh, but the, the Great Pyramid is aligned almost, the edges are perfectly aligned north, south, east, west. And the Sphinx is just a little bit off center. Um, but there are some uh, summer solstice alignments. If you're at the pause of the Sphinx, because the Sphinx would be in front here, uh, we're looking at the summer solstice sunset. So th there are certain sunsets where the sun is positioned behind. If you're looking from in front of the Sphinx, uh, the sun will set on the summer solstice right behind Kephren. So there are some astronomical alignments and again, you can always recognize Kefren has that limestone casing. And what's, what's interesting, archaeology, uh, or as archaeologists, this is the pyramid at Saqqara, which is maybe 10 or 20 miles, 10 miles from the Great Pyramid. And I took a horse ride to here. I recommend horses more than camels. I had a blast with uh, running horses in Egypt. If you rent a camel, the camel jockeys hold the camel, and they just walk you, and it's really fairly it's okay. But what I'm saying is if you rent horses, they say, sayonara, have fun, and you just take off on the horse. And well, usually they're riding another horse. But my point is, horses are a whole lot more fun to ride in the desert. You get to be Lawrence of Arabia, you get to put the Arab scarf on, and it's a blast. So I'm saying if you go there, do the horses, the camels are okay for photo ops, but I mean, you get a real rush, because they'll let you gallop. There's no fences, no trails. You don't have to just sit on the horse and kind of plod along. I mean, you can play Lawrence of Arabia, which, anyway. So I took horse, uh, a horse ride out to here. But this, this is dated uh, uh, slightly before. This is one of the first uh, pyramids that the archaeologists date. Uh, this is about 2900 BC. So they date this before the Great Pyramid, uh, which they date to 2850 BC. But you can see the crude construction here. It's like a layer cake. And it's really not that sophisticated. And this is another pyramid. This is at Dashur. This is called the Bent Pyramid at Dashur. And this is also about 29 or 2875 BC, also slightly before. Again, these two pyramids, uh, Saqqara and Dashur, the archaeologists claim were built before the Great Pyramid. And you can see here they screwed up. The architects started at one angle, and they realized it was too steep. They couldn't finish it, and they had to do a different angle. They really screwed this one up. Um, but it's also the stones are smaller. And the point is they, they went from these kind of really uh, mediocre pyramids. Uh, and if you go back to the, uh, well, the, the Great Pyramid, you'll see on the inside, it's the most sophisticated. And what's illogical is that they could make a technological leap to the most sophisticated pyramid after these two mediocre pyramids. And then you'll also see Kefren and Makarnos are also very much less sophisticated than this one. And if you know the progression of architecture in Gothic cathedrals, there was a Romanesque Gothic period. Anyway, there, there was a stretch of 100, 200 years where they gradually built up to higher and higher sophisticated Gothic cathedrals where you get the best Chartres, Notre Dame, et cetera. Um, so it, it takes a progression architecturally, normally, to get to the most sophisticated and the highest end architecture. And here, they went from the, the mediocre, and then in 25 years, they went to the most sophisticated. And then there was another 500 years of pyramid building, and they were all crummier or more mediocre, I should say, than the Great Pyramid. So it's, it's illogical, and I'll, I'll show you a bit of, of why in a minute here. Okay, so the Sphinx <clears throat> is, is aligned a little bit off-center. You can see the Sphinx here. One reason, and, and this has been on the History Channel with Robert Boval, Graham Hancock, and the geologist Shockley, because again, 
I believe the Sphinx and the Great Pyramid are connected. And Edgar Cayce, I'll, I'll show you some slides of the Hall of Records. Edgar Cayce proposes that the people from Atlantis left a subterranean temple underground between the Sphinx and the Great Pyramid called the Hall of Records. And so that means that the Sphinx and the Great Pyramid and the Hall of Records would be from Atlantis at least 10,000 BC or 36,000 BC. Uh, but anyway, Shockley, the geologist, and he was with Graham Hancock, also John Anthony West and Robert Boval. But notice the erosion here. Uh, the Sphinx is, is kind of layers of soft and hard limestone, sandstone. And according to the geologist Shockley, this erosion, he claims it's more from water. There's some vertical runoffs right here and right here, uh, as well as some horizontal wind blasts. And 10,500 uh, BC, there was actually more water in the Giza Plateau. Northern Egypt, the climate was different. They got a lot more water. When I was there, six weeks it rained once and everybody freaked out because there was a rain shower for 20 minutes and all the Egyptians were jumping up and down. They couldn't believe it, it was raining. I mean, they get like hardly any rain uh, in Cairo. But my point is, uh, and the geologist Shockley claims that this erosion, both wind and water, would have taken longer than, in other words, the archeologists claim that this is either uh, Cheops or his father's head, or this is Kefren's head. There's a dispute among archeologists which pharaoh this is, or if it is a pharaoh, because uh, it actually doesn't match a particular pharaoh. They do have sculptures of pharaoh's heads in museums, and the Sphinx doesn't actually match them perfectly. So anyway, due to the water and uh, wind, wind erosion, Shockley believes it's almost impossible to have the Sphinx 2850 BC because it, it just couldn't, you couldn't have that erosion because uh, it was at 2850 BC. I mean, there's proof there wasn't that much rain and there was more rain 10,500 BC. So that's some scientific evidence that the Sphinx is older. And then I'll get to some of the reason why the Great Pyramid is older. What's interesting is uh, there's some dispute over whether there's a, not a nose here on the Sphinx. And there's some dispute over whether Napoleon, some of his uh, cannon guys shot off the head, the nose of the Sphinx for target practice, which is disputed. <clears throat> but Napoleon did visit the inside of the Great Pyramid. And uh, he spent some time alone in the king's chamber and when he came out, he was all kind of visibly shaken. And his lieutenants or colonels said, Napoleon, wow, what, what did you experience in the king's chamber? And he never told him. He said it was just too freaky. <laughs> well, not, that, wasn't, he was, that wasn't his quote. But anyway, <laughs> he, was, he was disturbed, shaken, visibly shaken was the reports. And uh, supposedly at his deathbed in Elba or wherever he died uh, in exile, uh, someone asked him again before he died, what, what happened in the king's chamber of the Great Pyramid? You were there alone after you conquered Egypt. You know, this is early 1804, something like that. And he said, I saw my destiny. <clears throat> and that's all he would say about what his experience was in the king's chamber. Now, there was a rumor that Napoleon had the ability to uh, project out of his body astrally or etherically. And that's one reason his first bunch of victories, because he always stayed in his tent. He didn't get out on his horseback uh, until later in a battle. But at the beginning of the battle, he was in his tent and alone. And he'd send, you know, he had a battle plan. Anyway, the rumor was he'd astrally project over the battlefield. He'd see the position of all the enemy forces. He'd come back in his body, go out of the tent, get on the horse, tell his generals, okay, you got to go this way, that way, because they're this, but over. Anyway. That's a rumor. Uh, I can't substantiate that. It is a fact. He did visit the King's Chamber, the Great Pyramid. OK, uh, what else? Um, here, here's what's interesting on my personal journey was <clears throat> one night, and uh, you do these things at night, and you can't actually climb up. I climb because I wanted to meditate up here, which is, <laughs> you know, call, I'm crazy. OK, because I, I look for places to meditate everywhere. Because uh, I find it a real rush to meditate in these sacred places because of the energy. There's, there is a vibration 
I'm sure all of you have been to sacred places. You know, there's a different experience if you're in a church, any kind of church, cathedral, mosque, temple, Japanese temple, whatever. It's a different experience, much more reverent, sacred than if you're in Walmart, you know, trying to sit on the floor in Walmart and meditate. It's not, you know, it's not easy. If you go to a church, it's pretty cool. You know, it's quiet, et cetera. So I find these places, wherever I go, whether it's stone circles or ancient temples, um, they're wonderful places to meditate. Anyway, I, I did climb up one night on the back of his uh, hind legs. You can climb up here. Anyway, on his back, this was a real rush because I was, um, and again, I had to wait till the guards uh, were another, they were on the other side and you have to, anyway. So this was really uh, amazing to me and, and nobody knows this. This is part of the secrets of this lecture. <laughs> And by the way, I'll reveal some secrets, okay? I'm going to reveal some real secrets of what I claim are the spiritual initiations that are possible inside the king's chamber. Um, anyway, <clears throat> I'll reveal some secrets, but a lot of the secrets you have to discover on your own personal journey, as I'm sure you guys or everyone hopefully knows we're on a spiritual journey here. We've got so much time in this physical body. Hopefully everybody realizes we're spiritual beings in a physical body. We're gonna go somewhere else to a much amazing place when we transition to the pure spiritual realm from the physical. But anyway, uh, what's my point? Uh, I was on the back of the Sphinx here and I was walking along the back of the Sphinx, and there's this trap door. There's this metal door with a handle. I'm not kidding. This is part of the secrets of the lecture. You won't find this on the History Channel. Zaha Wahi, Hawis, that guy denies it. Swear to God. So I go to this metal door, and I lift up the handle, and, and it wasn't locked. And, and the door, it was a metal door about two feet by two feet, or two feet by three feet with a handle. So I lifted it up, and it had hinges, and I could put it down here. And I'm sitting there going, wow, this is pretty mind-blowing. <laughs> you know, and I'm not kidding. There is this hole, a, a, a perfect square, about two and a half feet by two and a half feet, cut in the middle of the back of the Sphinx. And I kind of look over, and there's no ladder. There's no handholds. It's just pure cut rock. It's like a perfect vertical well. And I had a flashlight, and so I, you know, I shine down, and I'm just looking into infinity. I mean, I'm, I'm just, there's nothing there. So I take out an Egyptian coin, you know, I do the flip in the air, no sound, you know, I, I mean, the, the coin fell, I did it twice. I, I, I never heard the coin hit the sand. So believe it or not, there, there is a, a opening inside the Sphinx that just, it, it goes straight down and they haven't, they haven't explored it or they haven't told anybody about it. There are some openings that they have been on the History Channel. <clears throat> they found some openings down below here uh, that go underneath the Sphinx. There's some tunnels that go into these small chambers under the Sphinx that have been on the History Channel. There's two of them. There's like one over here and there's one in the front. Small tunnels, small little openings, and they claim they don't go anywhere. <clears throat> But the one I saw was like laser cut. I mean, it was like this, whoosh. I mean, I, I, I wanted to go back with ropes and I couldn't, I didn't have time to explore it. That's one of the secrets is it goes somewhere and they don't tell you about it. <clears throat> okay, so this one, um, uh, this is, uh, yeah, this is why I come to MUFON. Uh, and if, if you know about etheric energy or Auras, we have auras, energetic auras around our bodies. You know, we're energy fields, we're spiritual beings with energy fields, all living things, plants, animals, birds, trees. We all have these living energy fields. I mean, the planet has a huge magnetic field around it. The Mother Earth, Gaia, there's a huge energy field around her. Uh, this is my interpretation of the energy field coming off the Great Pyramid, <laughs> um, which is different and, and there's sort of a glow here, and th this is from, and you know, you can believe me or not believe me, but occasionally there was a couple of times, uh, and it was usually around sunset or sunrise, when 
I'd glimpse the Great Pyramid, and I'd, I'd see sparks of energy come off the top, uh, etheric energy. And it would rise into the sky hundreds of feet. And I'd sort of see it out of the corner of my eye. And then if I, if I looked directly at it, it would kind of go away. So I had to, you had to kind of look peripherally. Well, it's also a gift. I mean, God, the, the higher power, whatever. Sometimes you get visions. Um, and anyway, I, I had a vision of the energy coming off the Great Pyramid. And it wasn't coming off the other two. So this, this is my interpretation of the energy coming off the Great Pyramid. And there's a belief that the Great Pyramid act, act, acted, and it probably still does, as an energy balance um, for the entire planet. That the Atlanteans, there was a whole different technology, crystal technology, uh, magnetic, etheric energy technology, light. If you know anything about light healing energy, orgon energy, they had a different energy um, understanding uh, of the universe and their connection to it than we do. And so my premise is that the Great Pyramid was some kind of uh, energy accumulator or transmitter or it somehow helped balance the energy of the Earth's magnetic, electromagnetic field. So th this is one of my interpretations of it. <clears throat> and, and I did see it. And the, the other interesting thing is I don't know if anybody's seen it, but there are uh, what are called etheric pyramids around the planet. <clears throat> and etheric pyramids, I, I've seen one, and I saw one. It was a couple of hundred yards away from the Great Pyramid, and it was just out in the desert, not connected to a stone pyramid. It was just an etheric pyramid. And I asked my spiritual teacher, I said, wow, look at that. And she goes, yeah, isn't it beautiful? <laughs> and it was like this glowing golden etheric pyramid about the same height as the Great Pyramid. I said, you see that? She goes, yeah, yeah, it's beautiful. And uh, a couple of other, I was with two other friends, and they saw it as well. Some days you couldn't see them. But anyway, my point is around the planet, there are these etheric pyramids. And th again, this is, you know, you can say I'm crazy. I'm just saying what I saw. Um, so there's uh, unusual things happening with these etheric pyramids. Um, anyway. The Sphinx has, it does have a temple here, which I'll show you some stones. Um, I had one interesting meditation. There's a tablet here at the paws of the Sphinx. I don't have a picture of it, but there is a tablet that is from 2800 BC that some pharaoh put up uh, with some hieroglyphics on it. Who knows the riddle of the Sphinx? Anybody? Anybody know the riddle of the Sphinx? Because there's a myth of if you didn't, if you walked in front of the Sphinx, the Sphinx would literally come alive, ask you a question, and then if you answered it correctly, you could pass on. If not, he'd kind of zap you or send you on his way. Um, anybody know the riddle of the Sphinx? It's it's what has um, the riddle of the Sphinx, and he'd ask this on for passerbys to let them go by the Sphinx. The riddle is, what has four legs in the morning? Two legs in the afternoon, three legs. three legs at night, correct, you know, okay. And the answer is a man, because as a baby, we're crawling on all fours in the morning of our life. In the afternoon, prime of our life, we're on two legs. And in the, well, sometimes some of us have to have a cane uh, or a crutch. There's a third leg to support us in old age. So that was the riddle of the Sphinx. Uh, there is an ancient temple here. And what's interesting is I have some pictures of the stone of the ancient temple. Well, this is, uh, this is a hypothesis from Edgar Cayce of where the Hall of Records is under here. And this hasn't been discovered, or if it has, it hasn't been publicized yet. And Edgar, Edgar Cayce thought this would be discovered by 2000 or 1998, but it hasn't been. Or if it has, they haven't let us know. But supposedly there's a circular temple underneath uh, I mean, the pyramid is over here. You can see the Sphinx, and there's an entrance hall, and then, then it goes to a circular temple here. So this was the Hall of Records. What the Hall of Records is, is it's from ancient Atlantis. They left artifacts or holograms or crystals uh, from the civilization because they knew it was going to fall apart with earthquakes, whatever, um, and their own self-destruction. 
So they preserved, like a museum, they preserved aspects of Atlantis, the history of Atlantis and artifacts in the Hall of Records under the Sphinx. There's supposedly also two other Hall of Records from Atlantis, perhaps one from Lemuria, one supposedly in Tibet. If you read a book by Lobsong Rampa called The Third Eye, which he had his third eye opened, which is a real rush if you've ever had your third eye opened. Um, there is supposedly a Hall of Records from Atlantis in Tibet. There's also one in Peru or the Bolivian border, uh, somewhere in the Andes Mountains. There's supposed to be another Hall of Records. That one might be from Lemuria. So there's supposed to be at least two or three on the planet. <clears throat> and again, this is all hypothetical. Edgar Cayce says it will be discovered when the time is right. Probably why it's not been discovered is because the military, there's probably some really cool crystal technology that the military could turn into death rays. So <laughs> my opinion is they probably haven't had it revealed to us yet because the military would take over the technology. And so it has, it's not the right time yet. The right spiritual involvement on the planet hasn't taken place. Okay, so this is sort of the front view of the Hall of Records. You can see the three pyramids. <clears throat> And then this is an artist's conception of the Hall of Records uh, going towards the uh, central circular temple underneath. And supposedly tarot images um, line the Hall of Records that the tarot is from ancient Atlantis. And if you know the Rider deck, which uh, the Order of the Golden Dawn, Aleister Crowley, and there was a woman artist, Pam White. She was really a beautiful. The Rider deck is, is probably, if you want to learn the most about symbology, uh, there's a lot of ancient mysteries and um, Egyptian symbols, sacred geometry symbols in the Rider deck. Anyway, there's supposedly tarot images here because images can explain things almost better than, you know, it's hard to translate hieroglyphs even or cuneiform from Babylonia. It, it's hard to translate writing, whereas images can be more translatable. So supposedly in the Hall of Records, it's full of more images than writing. And this, this is the temple uh, next to the Sphinx. And what's unusual uh, compared to other Egyptian temples is there's no hieroglyphs. And these stones are really massive. These columns and these lintels uh, I mean, these lintels are bigger than the ones at Stonehenge, and you can see the scale of the person here. But this, this temple could also potentially, there's sort of an architectural style, <clears throat> and I'll also show you the temple at Abydos, the Osirian temple. Uh, there's a different architecture than Pharaonic temples. If you look at Karnak or uh, Edfu, the, the temples, the traditional proven Pharaonic temples have a different architecture typically with hieroglyphs. Uh, what's interesting here is this rectangle. Um, mathematically, it forms the golden rectangle, which is based on the Fibonacci series. Uh, the Fibonacci series comes up in the mathematics of the Great Pyramid. Basically, it's rediscovered by the Italian mathematician in the 13, 1400s, Fibonacci. You take the number one, <clears throat> you add one to it, you get two. You add two to one, you get three, three to two, five, five, to three, eight, eight to five, 13. So it's a numeric progression, uh, eight to th uh, 13, 21, et cetera. If you divide the numbers, if you get up high enough, what's the next one? 21, 13. Anyway, if you divide 21 by 13, uh, you get close to phi, which is 1.618. There's, there's two key ratios, they're called harmonic ratios in sacred architecture. One is phi, which is 1.618, which is based on the ratio of the Fibonacci series. Again, you're taking like 21 and divide it by 13. Uh, and then the other real relationship is pi, which is the relationship of the uh, diameter of a circle to the circumference. <clears throat> uh, but this forms like a gold, what's called a golden rectangle is when the numeric values are either five by eight or eight by 13. And there's, there's part of the rectangle behind this. And uh, this, is, this is either uh, eight by 13 or 13 feet by 21 feet. Uh, so there's, there's certain sacred uh, measurements in or this temple complex. <clears throat> and again, this is next to the Sphinx. 
Okay, this, this is just for comparison. This is, uh, I can't pronounce it. This is in Peru. It's, it's a gateway, and I show it for comparison uh, because some archaeologists claim Podansky is one. Uh, this is in Peru. It's Saxiwana. Sac Saxiwana, thank you. It's, it's a gateway. Thank you. Yeah, uh, Jennifer's been there. <laughs> right, Saxiwana. Uh, but there's also some sacred ratios here, and I'm, uh, these are potentially older than, uh, these are supposedly pre-Incan. Um, there was a whole civilization before the Incans, uh, and so they actually don't know how old this is. But the architecture, it's, it's vaguely similar. Um, I mean, my opinion was that there was this older architecture that kind of popped up in other civilizations. Uh, this is in Malta. Uh, they do date this around 2,500, or no, 3,000 BC. They date, they date the temples at Malta, three to actually 4,000 BC, even they're arguing 5,000 BC. The temples at Malta are, are older than the uh, pharaonic uh, temples in Egypt. Uh, but these are just some comparisons. And this is um, at Puma Punca, uh, which is near the Bolivian border. Uh, this is, uh, there was a pyramid here, and Podansky thinks this is 10,000 years old. He thinks this complex, maybe not this wall, but Podansky thinks this gateway and these stones here uh, date to about 10,000 BC. This is newer construction. Um, I'm just showing these because these are potentially other older civilizations. This is also at uh, Puma Punca, or nearby, it's the gateway of the sun. This is one gigantic stone. It has an east-west equinox solar al alignment. You can see the sun set through here. Uh, this is Viracocha, uh, the deity of the pre-Incans. This is, again, Podansky thinks this is 10,000 BC. There, there was a pyramid behind this. As you entered this complex, there was a stone pyramid. It wasn't that high, uh, maybe 100 feet high. Uh, the Spanish, in the 1500s, they destroyed the pyramid like they destroyed a lot of Incan and pre-Incan sites. Uh, but I'm just showing this in comparison. This is interesting uh, because it's the oldest known religious temple in the world, quote, by traditional archaeologists. Anybody know where this is? Turkey. That's good, good. You guys read. <laughs> yeah, this is uh, Gobleki <clears throat> in Turkey, so uh, southern Turkey. And... It's, it's actually a circle of stones. Uh, you can see that they're T-shaped. It's one stone. And the archaeologists believe that the, uh, the top part of the T it represents a man's head. And this is his body. And there's also some, this is either a serpent. They're pretty sure this is a fox or a jaguar. Uh, but th they date this to 11,000 uh, years old, 9,000 BC. And, and they pretty much, 90% of traditional archeologists, this, this has just been a recent discovery in the last 10 or 20 years. They've been excavating Goblecki, a German archeologist, Schmidt. <clears throat> and uh, they have found some carved relief. But this is, this is older than Stonehenge. Again, Malta is maybe 5,000 BC. But this, this they really think is uh, 9,000 BC, uh, the first temple, the world's first temple. And it's also huge. These, these things are like uh, 15, 20 tons. And it's pretty hard to imagine how these guys put it together. OK, so this is uh, the monolith of 2001, the movie 2001. I just throw it in there for kicks, uh, <laughs> just, just to uh, entertain value, uh, is that you know, Arthur Clarke was on to something, that these, in the movie 2001, you know, the monolith was uh, something left by aliens uh, to give us clues. Well, in the beginning of the movie, the monolith, the apes are around it. The monolith um, emitted sounds, and the apes all of a sudden started playing with bones and making tools and stuff and weapons. So that, according to Arthur Clarke, it's a possibility that the aliens obviously have visited Earth before or this could be from Atlantis. Um, but anyway, that, that this was left uh, 
And then there was one on the moon that, that sent the whole spaceship to Jupiter because it sent a signal to Jupiter, et cetera. Um, but there is a tradition of aliens uh, leaving artifacts on the Earth. Anyway, these, these are images uh, of artist renditions of the energy fields uh, above the Great Pyramid. And so these are just different representations of the energy fields. Uh, I like this one because it's kind of emitting the energy. This is sort of like the energy I actually saw. Um, this, this one's interesting. This is my own photograph because um, stone circles, I don't know how many, uh, how many have visited stone circles in England. Yeah, a bunch of guys, people, gals, right? Okay, stone circles, these megalithic stone circles, this one's at Castle Rig. This is like 2500 BC. A lot of people don't really, Stonehenge has also started actually 2800, 2900 BC. What's interesting, if you play with dowsing rods or if you've seen this, uh, this is again my opinion, I've sort of seen these things. There's etheric cones of energy around these stone circles. And this is my interpretation of the cone of energy that these stone circles produce. And what's interesting is, and if you've played with dowsing rods, you can actually douse uh, to find the slope, the angle here, you, you can actually douse at different heights to get the, um, you know, you can douse close to the ground. Anyway, you can, you can find the angle of the cone of energy and it matches the slope of the Great Pyramid, which is interesting. The slope of the Great Pyramid is 51 degrees, 51 minutes. And I'll get into the mathematics of that in a minute. But uh, that's, this is my opinion of, of the energy, the etheric energy around stone circles. And again, it matches the slope. I'll get to that, why there's that 51 degree slope of the Great Pyramid. So these are some other artist projections <clears throat> of the pyramids, or the Great Pyramid. Uh, this one's almost a, a crystal. Uh, you can see the crystal. There's almost prisms that form a pyramid shape. And this one's actually a, a glass. This was done by an artist. Uh, he used software that I use. Um, uh, this is colored glass. <laughs> uh, th this is actually very close to um, the energy that I saw come off the top of the Great Pyramid. This, this is actually closer to what the energy looks like than that slide I showed of the Sphinx. Um, and this, this, I think, is a pretty amazing uh, artist rendering. There is some like radiating energy. And again, we don't know why the Atlanteans, if they used it for some kind of energy balancer uh, for the planet's etheric energy, uh, there's also a hy hypothesis that they had um, anti-gravity ships and that the energy transmitted from the Great Pyramid would help power the Atlantean, you know, the personal anti-gravity. The Atlanteans had UFOs uh, and or given to them by aliens. <laughs> uh, but the, the energy transmitted from the Great Pyramid helped the anti-gravity process of the personal hovercraft. And sometimes I would see uh, kind of streams of energy. This is again actually close to what I saw coming off the Great Pyramid with these streams of energy. And this, this is actually a Mayan pyramid. Uh, some artist rendered a Chichen Itza uh, pyramid in glass. <clears throat> this fellow, Peter Tompkins, this is a great book, uh, Secrets of the Great Pyramid. Uh, he, he does go into a lot of the archaeological exploration of the Great Pyramid, but he does have one chapter where he does present the hypothesis uh, that it was used as a temple of initiation. Some of the architectural, uh, quote, science behind why the Great Pyramid, if, if you look at, uh, let me advance, right here. Here's Kefren and here's Mykernos. And notice that architecturally, and this is true, the Great Pyramid is really the only pyramid that has inner chambers built throughout the inside of the structure going up. You can see this is the uh, king's chamber right here. Uh, these are called Davidson's chambers above the king's chamber, but that's the king's chamber, the grand gallery. This is the queen's chamber. This is the descending passage. This, this is where you actually enter the side of the Great Pyramid. Uh, you come down the descending passage to what's known as the pit. 
The ascending passage goes to this grand gallery. This goes to the Queen's Chamber, the King's Chamber. These are air vents. I'll get to them in a minute. They have astronomical implications. But the Great Pyramid, this is, it's really mind-blowing. How many people have been there? Oh, that's pretty cool. OK, so you, you, you know that inside, it's just totally amazing. Architecturally, the stones are huge. They're, the stones, if you look at the quality of the stones, they look different. The granite, everything's different than the stones inside here. My point is the two pyramids, this is Kefra Makarnos. Notice that the inner chamber is just at ground level. They, they just, what they did was they dug an, a descending passage, and this is where the pharaohs were typically buried. So in most pyramids in typical pharaonic e Egypt from 2850 BC to before the Greeks and well, the Romans conquered Egypt, anyway, the, the pharaohs were buried underground, but the rest of the pyramids, see there's no chambers up in here. So the construction is relatively simple. You just dig a passageway, you have a, a chamber with a sarcophagus, and there were hieroglyphs here and here, but there's no hieroglyphs inside the Great Pyramid. And so architecturally, these are much easier to build than the Great Pyramid. And so if, if this was built before these two, why were these two not as sophisticated as this one? So th this is the architectural anomaly in, in that the sophistication of the Great Pyramid, like in the timeline, just popped up. I mean, it's, it's like finding a 747 buried under Stonehenge or something. I mean, it's that much of an anomaly. Yes? Where's the S chamber with the wiggly line? I mean, it's not a straight line. Uh, this is a, um, it's like a subterranean cave. It's hard to get to, you have to wiggle. I went down in there, it's, it's not much. It's just, um, it's, it's really, I think, for ventilation because air flows from, uh, there's a, this, it's an air passage basically to help ventilate the uh, pit down here. But any question's a good question. It's, it's just a rough cave, it's not a real. Is it wet down there? I mean, when the... No, no, they keep the, uh, there's a door here and it, it, basically it hardly ever rains in Egypt. I mean, they get about one inch of rainfall in Cairo for the whole year. In the old days, it was wetter. Um, what they had was the original door, <clears throat> it was a huge slab of stone that pivoted and you could push on it and the slab, it was like a 10 ton slab and you pushed on it and the slab like tilted up so you could get in there. And what happened in the 1100s is, uh, well, d during the ancient Greek times, Herodotus visited the Great Pyramid, and this was open. This, this, you could actually push the stone slab and open it. And Herodotus described getting inside the Great Pyramid. <clears throat> and there's actually Greek graffiti inside here. Uh, and then, then it got closed up. No one knew where the opening was. And when the Arabs broke in in the 1100s, they had to dig away. What they did was they couldn't find the opening. This is the tunnel they dug when they, uh, the Arabs, because uh, in the 1100s, some guy, they wanted to rob this place. They couldn't find the opening. This was, yeah, this is, it's not here. This is the tunnel uh, the Arabs dug in the 1100s to get inside, because they couldn't find the opening, so they dug a tunnel, yeah. Um, but here's what's interesting mathematically is if, if you take the length, the length is greater than the height, and I'm talking about the height down the center. <clears throat> so if, if you take the length of the base of the pyramid uh, and divide it by the height, you get a perfect uh, phi relationship. You get 1.618. That's why the angle is 51 degrees, 51 minutes, this, the slope. It's because the, it's the height to uh, width ratio is phi. And what that does is it's a sacred proportion that sets up the energy field. And that's why you get the conical energy fields of stone circles. It's, it's Mother Earth's way of, it's, it's the perfect uh, energy field, happens to be based on the width to height ratio of phi. Um, and there's also a relationship, if you take the distance of all four sides um, and then divide it into the distance between the Earth and the Sun, you get like one million or something. Um, there are some pi ratios coming up. Down here in the, what's known as the pit, um, and, and here's, here's why I think the Great Pyramid was a temple of initiation, 
is because if, if you know the aspect of entering a cathedral or a mosque, you know, there's a reason architecturally why you go down the long um, nave of a Gothic cathedral, you cross the transept, and you go further down the long nave to get to the altar area. And, you know, it forms a cross. So the priests, you know, at the beginning of mass, the priests might walk down the aisle, the long aisle of a Gothic cathedral with the smoking incense or what have you. So there's a religious procession in a Gothic cathedral when they do the high ceremonies or high masses. There's a religious procession. And so there's a likelihood that why these chambers are up inside the Great Pyramid is because it was for different religious ceremonies and religious processions. And so the different things would happen in the different chambers. And if you've been down here, this, this is actually, uh, the pit actually has a, a dome ceiling. It's a natural kind of dome ceiling. And if you noticed, how many people went down here? Okay, there, there are some big rocks that almost look like chairs to sit on. And I, w I was down here with my spiritual teacher. Again, this is, we go in after six o'clock at night, we bribe the guard and go in. <clears throat> but I, I call this the uh, satsang hall or in, in other words, in the process of initiation, if this was a temple for initiation, the priests would first take the young initiates down into the underworld. So you go into the underworld first, you go down into Mother Earth, and there'd be certain ceremonies here to introduce them to the beginning stages of a, of a spiritual initiation, which is connecting to your spirit body uh, through the third eye and the crown chakra. So that this, this would act as the beginning of, they're like stages of initiation. There's basically one, two, three stages of different chambers for different stages of initiation. These are almost equal in initiation because there's some feminine energy. I, I, I mean, I put these almost at equal status for initiation, but this is sort of at a different introductory status. And what's interesting is in the pit, there's a huge circle of cut stone that goes down about 20 feet to this pile of rubble. And they haven't excavated, it's a perfectly cut well that they haven't excavated and they haven't explained why. Uh, and there's a rumor that that leads down to the Hall of Records, that they, they haven't excavated this. And anyway, it, it does look like, uh, I call it the satsang hall or the introductory uh, stage. So anyway, then, then the priests would take the young initiates up here and there'd be a, a different ceremony here in the queen's chamber. <clears throat> And perhaps, and, and this is unknown, I, I think these two chambers were used both by men and women, that it wasn't strictly a male hierarchy, that there was a matriarchal aspect, that the initiations in Atlantis were open to men and women. Um, so anyway, you go up after you're down in the underworld, you ascend and then ascend again, and you go into the queen's chamber for a particular initiation. And then, the, then you go up the Grand Gallery, and you, you might do this in different stages or different nights or different days. Uh, again, this is a hypothesis. They, then you go up the Grand Gallery. This would be the culmination. Maybe this would take months. May, maybe they, the initiates would be here for a couple of weeks or a couple of months, and then here, and then here. So it might not all be in one day, uh, but it lends itself architecturally to religious procession and religious ceremonies. And they also never found, there's no hieroglyphs here, they've never found a mummy. Uh, the only evidence from Cheops is up in one of Davidson's chambers up here. There's a cartouche, which is a pharaoh's uh, signature. Uh, it's a hieroglyph, and it's painted, and well, it's carved. It's a stone about this big, like it's a slab of stone, and it has, Cheops uh, cartouche, his signet, on it. And that's why the archaeologists call it Cheops, uh, is because they found that's it. I mean, uh, the handout's from a book by Paul Brunton. It's called, what's the name of the book, right? Uh, a Search in Secret Egypt, right? Thank you. And uh, Paul Brunton, uh, he was a 
kind of a mystic and a writer. In the 1920s and 30s, uh, he wrote two books. He, well, he went to India to discuss, uh, study under certain um, gurus in India. And he also went to the Punjab. He, he studied in the northern region, the same region my spiritual teachers studied in. Anyway, in the 1930s, he visited the Great Pyramid <clears throat> and he got uh, permission to spend the night uh, alone. He spent the entire night inside the Great Pyramid. And he had read some other writers. I mean, even in the 1930s, there were some people writing books about Atlantis. <clears throat> so At Atlantis, well, e even the late 1800s, I mean, there have been books about this ancient civilization from, yeah, at least the late 1800s. Anyway, Paul Brunton read about some of the books mentioning that the Great Pyramid was a tomb for initiation from this ancient civilization. He decided to check it out. This handout has a chapter where he spent the night inside the Great Pyramid, and he went to the king's chamber, and he fasted for three days uh, before going in here because he felt that the king's chamber and he was drawn, if, if you know Native American medicine men, they go on vision quests for days and days on the tops of mountains. And so you get pulled spiritually to do vision quests. If you've been involved in Native, Amer Native American vision quests, sweat lodges are an aspect of it. Anyway, he had a vision quest, go in the king's chamber. You know, he almost had a voice tell him, telling him, this is the 1930s. Anyway, he, he goes in there and he lies down in the sarcophagus and uh, I've, I've done this too, is, is it's, it's really beautiful because if you go in there at night and I bribe the guard, um, I got two hours alone in the king's chamber and I told him I, I turn off all the electricity because if how many people have been there during the day, there are these naked light bulbs and these annoying fluorescent, anyway, it's noisy, there's tourists, you're lucky if you get some time alone in these chambers at two in the afternoon. So anyway, at night, I had him turn off the electricity. There's no sound. And Paul Brunton talks about the absence of sound, how beautiful silence is. And if you've ever been in a Gothic cathedral late at night, it's pretty quiet. And so he uh, started meditating here in the sarcophagus of the king's chamber. Anyway, at some point, and it's in the handout, he leaves his body astrally and he floats above his body inside the king's chamber. Oh, and by the way, these chambers have mathematical uh, harmonic proportions. That phi proportion, 1.618, both of these chambers have uh, sacred proportions to them relating to phi. And they also have special acoustic properties. The musician uh, Horn, Paul Horn, actually has a CD where he played a flute inside the king's chamber. There's special acoustic qualities, which again, if priests were chanting, if, if you chant Om, I, I don't know if anybody did it when they visited the chamber, but if, if you say out loud Om, the Om, after, after you stop the chant, Om like resonates in the chamber for like 30 seconds, it's a real trip. So these have special acoustic properties, which again, lend themselves towards chanting, uh, religious ceremonies. Anyway, Paul Brunton, uh, in the middle of the night, he floated above his body, and he writes about this in the handout. These, these astral beings show up in the king's chamber, and they say, wow, thank you for coming. We know you're on a vision quest, and we're here to help you understand why you were pulled to come to the king's chamber. And these astral beings explain that they're from Atlantis or a higher civilization or, or a higher spiritual realm, if I can use that term. Um, and so these astral beings start telling Paul Brunton in his astral body about the reasons for why the Great Pyramid is a temple for initiation. And part of it is so that you do have the opportunity and, and part of it's grace, if you believe in grace and you know, some days you have crummy days and some days you have vision quests. And, you know, you feel a greater connected connectiveness to the higher power. Uh, so Paul Brunton, uh, he had an epiphany uh, and it was also explained to him by these astral beings that, that the Great Pyramid was a temple from ancient Atlantis 
and that it was meant for initiates to leave their body and discover that they're spiritual beings, that they're, they're not just this physical lump of clay. And they took them on a brief journey um, because you, you can pass through stone uh, in your astral body. And uh, so he had some various wisdom or knowledge passed down to him. And at some point later in the night, because um, he actually went up into some higher astral realms uh, and had some, quote, further initiations. And then at the end of this chapter in the handout, he comes back to his body. And you know that, that was his spiritual epiphany. Um, Did that happen to you when you were there? Well, here's what's interesting. And this is part of, um, I rarely tell this. Um, and, and I asked my spiritual teacher a couple of years ago if I can start telling some of these experiences I had. And she said, yeah, go ahead, tell people about etheric pyramids, they'll think you're crazy. Tell them you saw etheric energy coming off the top. Anyway, um, I did have an initiation. I mean, she initiated me uh, like a few months before this trip to Egypt. But I did have about half an hour alone uh, one night with my spiritual teacher in the king's chamber. She told me to lie down on the sarcophagus. We turned the lights off. And I was hoping, come on, because I had read this Paul Brutton article before I went there. I had, I had the book. If you want to see the book, Secrets of uh, Ancient Egypt, I took, th this has been to Egypt and back. This is, uh, so I had some prior knowledge of what, what Paul Brutton went through. And man, I was hoping, OK, uh, come on, uh, come on, God, take me up. And uh, here's what happened is, it's hard to describe, but uh, my spiritual teacher opened up my heart chakra, basically. I didn't have an astral experience like Paul Brutton. What happened to me, and, and this probably has happened to a number of people, is uh, she opened my heart chakra, and, and I felt, you know, when all of a sudden you have an epiphany of feeling love for, like, everybody in the room or everybody, maybe your family on Christmas, but sometimes you have, like, feelings of love for just a lot of people. Maybe it's a congregation and in a church. You have an epiphany where you just feel an overwhelming feeling of love from your heart for everybody. And animals, whatever, trees. And so I had this overwhelming feeling of love for everybody on the planet. And then what happened, uh, this lasted a few minutes, and it was really beautiful. Um, and then what happened, because it's the flip side of, of love, is suffering. And Buddha talked about, it was obviously one of his tenets, uh, was suffering. And I, I, all of a sudden, I felt the suffering of like a whole bunch of poor people in Egypt. <laughs> I felt like a lot of pain in my heart from, because um, there's a lot of poor people, trust me. Cairo is, is the poverty level is pretty bad. So for a few minutes, I felt this in, incredible love for humanity, and then I felt this incredible amount of suffering that people were going through. And it really, it really hurt, and it really knocked me out almost. Um, and I asked my spiritual teacher, wow, what's going on? And she goes, well, compassion and, and understanding suffering is, is understanding love. I mean, there's the, the, it's unfortunate aspect of this planet we're on and the lifetime we're going through is, is there's highs and lows. And Buddha talked about suffering. Anyway, that was my experience. OK, thank you. But yeah, Christ supposedly did visit uh, because between 12 and 30, you know, there's a bunch of missing years between his childhood and when he, Christ started his ministry. And he went to Egypt and was initiated in the, in the Great Pyramid. John the Baptist. Correct. Um, and Pythagoras supposedly was initiated also. Uh, there were some priests at the time of Pythagoras, and he actually spent 18 to 20 years in Egypt, and his 345, the Pythagorean theorem was from, he learned it in Egypt from the, because uh, the temples and, and the Great Pyramid, it, it was like going to the universities that we go to. Um, for, for an ancient Greek, I mean, they had temples, which were also outdoor, indoor universities. But Pythagoras and a number of Greeks went to uh, study under the priests in Egypt. Uh, so again, it, it lends itself 
architecturally and in different accounts of, of people's experiences that the Great Pyramid was used as a temple for initiation. And the Grand Gallery is very mind-boggling. Uh, the, the other interesting thing is when you enter both the Queen's Chamber and the King's Chamber, there's this act, and you, you guys that have been there, you know about it. You have to, you have to bend down like this, and, and it's like you have to be humble in the face, in, in the presence of God. So God, they designed this thing to force you to be humble, um, you know, before you stand up inside the chambers for initiation. Uh, this is a three-dimensional cutaway. It's, it's really, if you think about how to build this thing with all these chambers at diagonals, and I, I mean, it's really complex to build. I mean, if, if you talk to an architect today, I mean, they go, I, I, I mean, with huge cranes, and I mean, these blocks of stone, the, the blocks of stone in the king's chamber are like 20 tons. I mean, there, it's an enormous undertaking that's, that's a real mystery. And I've asked my spiritual teacher several times how the, how the pyramid was built. And she says, or she told me I, I wasn't quite at the stage of consciousness to understand how the Atlanteans built the Great Pyramid. In other words, they were at a entirely another level of consciousness as a culture than, than we are today, spiritually and technology, and they, were, they had a closer link to the spirit world, so that the veil between the physical world and the spirit world was much thinner in Atlantis. They could, everybody could move back and forth, physical to the astral. Anyway, my spiritual teacher says, if when I get to that place, I'll understand how this was built, that she, she couldn't explain it to me because she says you got to get there in meditation or you got to get there in that state of consciousness to understand how they even built this thing. And there's the question of whether it was coalesced out of the ether. It, it, the, the whole construction is, is really, uh, I, I haven't understood it yet. But here's a couple of interesting things astronomically. Are, there are some air chambers that uh, go through. And what's interesting is uh, certain times of the year, uh, they line up, the, from the king's chamber, there's an air vent that lines up to the, one of the stars in Orion's belt. And astronomically, it only happens so many times in every couple of hundred years or couple thousand years that you get, say, an alignment at midnight on the summer solstice or the winter solstice or the equinox. Uh, so, so they've gone back, Robert... Uh, Boval and Hancock have calculated that in 10,500 10, BC, at like midnight on the summer solstice, if you could sight through this air shaft, uh, you, you would sight Orion at midnight on the summer solstice uh, in 10,500 BC. And this is from the Queen's Chamber. It lines up to Sirius. Uh, Orion was connected to Osiris, and Sirius is connected to the constellation Isis. And then over here, there's a couple of air shafts that do line up with some other stars. And there's a theory that if you leave your body, if you astrally travel, uh, like, like there's either alien worlds or astral worlds, if, if, you, if you leave your body and go through the air shaft and go to the constellation, there is something happening in Orion, the Pleiades, there are certain constellations where I think there's other <coughs> astral realms or alien realms. And so there, there's hints here that if you leave your body through the air shafts and at certain times you, you'd actually be pointed towards where you're supposed to go. And so this, this is some, some other aspects. And these are scientifically proven that at certain times, again, it's every so many thousand years, and it's based on the precession of the equinoxes that these air shafts do line up to certain stars. And, well, this one's interesting because it, it's showing the three pyramids pointing towards Orion's belt at a certain time of the year. The, this one I just put because energetically, um, the Great Pyramid is four-sided. These are three-sided tetrahedrons. This is a, a double tetrahedron. Uh, but there's different etheric energy like if you have a, a massive four-sided pyramid, there's, there's also a etheric pyramid, in my opinion, that go, projects downward under the ground. So you actually get 
a, a double pyramid. You get a stone pyramid above the ground, and you get an etheric pyramid. It's an octahedron uh, below the ground. And this is showing, uh, well, this is from a Merkaba meditation slide. It, it's showing the human being meditating inside a double tetrahedron. That these pyramids, whether they're three-sided or four-sided in three dimensions, create different energy fields. And here, here you can see this is a four-sided pyramid, and then the four-sided pyramid below it. This, this is the magnetic field of the Earth. So again, there's a hypothesis that the Great Pyramid is linked to balancing the energy field of the Earth. This is from Boval and Hancock's book, is that the placement of the three pyramids on Giza, they're not quite in a perfect diagonal, and they match the three stars in Orion are not in a perfect diagonal. And, but again, these, uh, these other pyramids, this is Cheops here, or the Great Pyramid, this is Kefra and the Karnos. So these two were built much, much later, in my opinion. But whoever built these two may have put them in these positions, not in a perfect diagonal, but to match uh, the position of the three stars in Orion's belt. This is in the book Orion Mystery Bo by Boval and Hancock. I don't know if I buy this one, but this is the constellation Cygnus. These are the three pyramids, and this is Cygnus the Swan. There is some temple ruins way out here in the desert that they're basing why this, there's no alignment to Cygnus. And, and so they're basing these on temple ruins in the desert that form. Uh, th this one I don't, I don't buy quite as much as, uh, this, this one's more believable than Cygnus. Okay, anyway, the mathematics, uh, this is called squaring the circle. This, this is when you have the, the distance of the square is about the same as the distance of the circumference of the circle. It's, it's a sacred geometry trick. Uh, but they're showing the, the Great Pyramid here. Uh, you get the 51 degree slope when you hit, when you have the square and the circle of equal dimensions and you go from the radius or diameter center to the top of the circle you get the 51 degree slope. And what's interesting here, if you know this symbol, this is the Vesica Pisces. This is where they got the fish symbol in Christianity, by the way, if you're not familiar with the origins of the Pisces or the fish symbol. It, it's actually, it's, it's two circles interlocked, but you get the, um, if you cut off the two circles here and here, uh, and you get the inside piece and the extra pieces here and here, you get the fish. Pisces symbol from Christ's time. Uh, but what they're doing here is drawing two circles inside the radius of the Vesica Pisces, and you also get the proportions of the Great Pyramid. And the Vesica Pisces shows up in Christianity. You'll see this in some stained glass windows. At Chartres, there's actually a picture of, uh, in stained glass, the Virgin Mary holding Christ, the baby, here inside uh, a stained glass window that has this shape. Uh, this gets a little complicated, but what's interesting is the entrance here, again, you get the Vesica Pisces in the center here and the Great Pyramid from the intersection there. But the, the entranceway to the pyramid is at the point where the circle crosses that point going up from the pyramid is the entrance to the pyramid. There's some sacred geometry. My point is there's some sacred geometry to the locations of the yeah, passageways and things. So this one's interesting because it's showing, um, I'm not, they're getting the three, four, five triangle from drawing a little circle here. It gets complicated. But um, again, they're showing that you can get the, the shape of the pyramid from, and it, it's what sacred geometers call squaring a circle. And it's, it's when you get the, again, the, the length of the four sides of the square equals the length of the perimeter of the circle. Uh, and then the circle, you get, you get this uh, overlap. When, when you hit the top of this circle, uh, you get the, the point of the pyramid. This is the diameter. And you get the ratio of phi, 51 degrees. But it's something in nature. In, in other words, Mother Earth creates these energy fields for a reason in this particular shape. The, the phi ratio, it shows up in sunflower seeds. The phi ratio shows up in, if, if you look at Milky Way, the galaxy from millions of light years away, you, you get certain phi ratios all throughout the universe. Seashells, you know the Nautilus? 
the, sea, the Nautilus shell has a phi ratio. So it just pops up in nature because it's the energy field. Mother Earth has an energy field that creates the phi ratio in, in creations of nature and man. Right, so th this is the Osirian temple, and I believe, and some other people believe, this is in Abydos. You can see these giant monoliths that this potentially also could be a temple from Atlantis because the architecture is so different from, um, again, Edfu or Karnak. Some of the traditional pharaonic temples, the Seti temples, are in Abydos. And the, these ancient ones, uh, these ancient temples, don't have any hieroglyphs. Uh, so this is potentially much older. And what's interesting, this is called the flower of life symbol. This, this is actually, I think some Coptic Christians put this here later, but, but this, this symbol is carved on one of these t uh, columns at, at Abydos, is the flower of life. But it's, it's much later in time. I don't think it was uh, part of the origins, but if you know anything about Drunvalo Mikeldizic, uh, the flower of life, it's all a bunch of intersecting circles and you get this trippy flower of life pattern. But it's a beautiful sacred geometry symbol. What I'm just showing is some contrasting pyramids. Real briefly, uh, the Mayans were much later in time. You know, this is about 700 AD. Uh, this is Kukulkan or Chichen Itza, the pyramid. The Mayans were one of the few, and again, pyramids seem to have, they pop up in different cultures. There's some in China, even. They had steps, and they actually had temples up here. And so their, their understanding of the cosmos was a little different, because traditional Egyptian pyramids, you couldn't, you, they had sloping, you couldn't actually get to the top of the pyramids, but the, the, the Mayans had temples up here, they had nine levels to represent the nine astral realms, spiritual realms above the earth. There are nine layers in a lot of these Mayan pyramids. But I'm just contrasting some of the Mayan pyramids. When I was at uh, Chichen Itza, the, the energy is totally different here than the Great Pyramid. I, I couldn't get permission to climb this one, uh, but on another trip, th this one is sort of ominous because they did, unfortunately, they went through a Darth Vader period in the Mayan, the later Mayan had human sacrifice. For hundreds of years, the Mayans didn't practice human sacrifice. They, it, they had Darth Vader priests take over the priesthood. Anyway, this, this has a really weird energy at Kukulkan compared to the Great Pyramid. There's, there's a much more optimistic energy at the Great Pyramid, in my opinion. But there is, uh, some of the Mayan pyramids do have inner chambers because they did have priests or kings buried there. So th there is some sophistication there. Um, this is the Pyramid of the Sun outside of Mexico City. This is actually before the Aztec. This is early Toltec, around 100 AD. Um, and what's interesting is that the Pyramid of the Sun, this is 20 miles outside of Mexico City. Here's the two in comparison. This is the Great Pyramid and this is the Pyramid of the Sun. You can see it's much lower, but the, the length of the side is almost identical. So the early Toltecs, what, what, what's interesting is that the, and it's a little hard to see because they, they built this in stages, but at, at the bottom here, the, this overall length is the same as the Great Pyramid. So they were onto something. Is the angle the same? No, no, the angle's much lower. That's why the energy, the etheric energy of this pyramid, I haven't climbed this one, but the energy is much different on this one than this one because of the uh, slope is different and it, it affects the etheric energy. But I think their understanding of earth energy and etheric energy, it was different because this is 100 AD versus 10,000, you know, dur dur this is different than Atlantis. So their consciousness understanding was different. Um, this is actually the Pyramid of the Magicians at uh, Ushmal, and I did get permission to climb this. I had, this was just this past January. I managed to climb this, and it's one of the few pyramids with rounded corners. And the interesting thing about the Pyramid of the Magicians at Ushmal, and I, I really recommend, because if you go back to, uh, this, this is Chichen Itza, Kukulkan, and this one's the Pyramid of the Magicians they didn't have human sacrifice here. 
And this was a shamanic vision quest pyramid. The shamans would go here for vision quests. Um, and they almost used this, like Native Americans use different mountains for vision quests. And so this was off limits to human sacrifice because the shamans, and, he, and even currently today, shamans have permission from the Mexican government to use this as a vision quest. They go up here at sunset, they spend the night up here, and then they you know, come down in the morning. What I did was I had to, bribes have gone up. I, I had to pay the guard 50 bucks, 500 pesos at like seven in the morning uh, before people arrived. And I had a Mayan guide who arranged this for me. But I had permission, anyway, I climbed up here at sunrise to meditate. I had about 20 minutes alone up here. And it was a really good vibration. The, the energy of the Pyramid of the Magi, anybody been there? Ushmal? Yeah, it's a really different energy. Did you feel it was different than Chichen Itzen? I mean, it, energetically, Chichen Itzen to me was like, man, I wanted, that place was intense. But this place, I felt, had a really beautiful energy. And uh, again, I think the reason why is because the shamans use it for vision quests. This, this is the same pyramid. They built it in different stages. There's a temple at the top. There's actually a temple here and a temple there. Uh, but you can see the difference night and late afternoon. Uh, this is just comparison. This is the temple at Tikal in Palenque. This, this one's interesting. If you ever go to Mayapan, Mayapan is in the north of the Yucatan, it's not, well, it's maybe 30, 40 miles from Ushmal. Mayapan, when I visited Mayapan, there was hardly anybody there. This, this pyramid's not very high compared to the Pyramid of the Magicians, but a lot of these pyramids in Mexico, they don't let you climb unless you bribe the guards at six in the morning like I did. But this one, you can actually climb, and like when I was here, there was like nobody there. Mayapan is a beautiful place, and it's one of the most under-visited Mayan temples. And this is at Coba. This pyramid, you can climb at Coba. It's pretty beat up, but uh, the energy here at Mayapan, it, it was a really beautiful energy. And again, the, a lot of the Mayan pyramids have these nine levels for the nine realms of the, their astral realms. Uh, this, this I designed for NASA. And it's, it's a temple complex I designed. You can see the astronauts here. It's on the moon. And I designed this, and I, said, I sent it into NASA, and I said, you should really build, you know, you're going to build these habitations on the moon, and you should have a temple, you know, you should have some place for worship. So this is a non-denominational temple I designed for the moon. And these blue trusses, are actually, it's hard to see, but it it's, it's, uh, mimics the size and shape of the Great Pyramid. Uh, it's a truss pyramid on top of these columns, and it's 51 degrees. The slope of the truss pyramid is 51 degrees. And so NASA's, uh, of course, this would cost a fortune. Uh, but th this is my proposal for NASA, because they, you know, they, they, they don't think anymore about, hey, let's build a sacred place on the moon before we build anything else. You know. Not yet. <laughs> this is on exhibit right now. The American Institute of Architects, uh, their museum in Washington has this on exhibit among some other um, designs for the architecture on the moon. Uh, but NASA hasn't gotten back to me yet. I think it's a bit expensive. You, you know, they're gonna put these cylindrical habitations first. Have you made a model of it? Yeah, what, what? Have you made a model of it? Yeah, I have a physical model and a... Oh, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, it tests really well. For, you can build cardboard models, wood models, and what's interesting, I've had students do this, is if you build a model that's the same shape as the Great Pyramid, whether it's cardboard or wood, here's an interesting thing, is you put a box inside your pyramid, and the box is maybe a third or halfway up, slice an apple in half, put the apple on top of the raised box, put the pyramid on top of the uh, apple, and you make a control experiment. You make a rectangle, like make a shoe box and do the same thing. Make a big shoe box, put another box inside it, slice an apple in half, and you compare in three days, the apple sliced in half inside the pyramid that's the same proportion as the Great Pyramid. It won't be as brown as the other apple. <laughs> and and I, I, I had students do this, and they, they, they couldn't believe that it actually worked. 
that it, it's, it proves there is an energy to the shape of that uh, Great Pyramid. Uh, this is one of my sculptures of cast bronze panels based on the Great Pyramid uh, design. This is supposed to be about 24 feet high. It hasn't been built. I need a, I need a sponsor. I need a Bill Gates. <laughs> Uh, this is actually a five-sided pyramid in the Cydonia region on Mars. And the, uh, there's a face on Mars somewhere. Yeah. So in the Cydonia region, they found a gigantic face from, if you look at it from above. And this is actually a five-sided pyramid, and they call this the city. Uh, there's some other structures here. So they, they think this was an alien city from a couple of million years ago. Uh, but NASA doesn't buy it. <laughs> But the five-sided pyramid and the face on Mars is pretty interesting. This is the Sphinx at night. Uh, if you go to the Sound and Light Show, it's, it's entertaining. Uh, they actually got a comet here. Uh, this is Kefrin with a comet. I like this one's lit up at night. The Great Pyramid. These are astronomical observatories. This is at Mayapan. These are Mayan, 700 AD. There was a temple here that they're these columns were higher, and this is the ruins of a temple. But this is the astronomical observatory. And there, there's perforations here. There, there was actually a spiral stair. Uh, they use this as a naked eye observatory. This is at Mayapan, but this one's at Chichen Itza, and this is Karakol. But the Mayans built two of these circular astronomical observatories. And this is actually at Koba. Uh, this is a, a third astronomical observatory. There's some stairs to get up to the top here. But the Mayans actually, this one is interesting because they built the astronomical observatory in the shape of a kind of conical pyramid. This is a temple of the seven dolls at Diesel B. Chatoun. It's also an astronomical observatory. Yeah, there's an east-west alignment here. I was at Ushpan and Mayapan and this site just a few months ago. <laughs> This is a shamanic vision quest cave in northern Mexico that tourists, it's not on any tourist brochures. You have to find a Mayan guide that ha lets you in. And I found a Mayan guide that let me in. And it's, it's a vision quest cave that shamans would go to. And this was the entrance to it. I'm down below looking up. It's at Calcutoc. And these are some images looking up. But they'd go there for days on end for vision quests, the Mayan shamans. For, this is, goes back thousands of years. And what's interesting is uh, you have to, the vision quest area is like at least a kilometer inside the cave. So you get further and further away from the opening. And the, so the opening you know, gets smaller and smaller. Well, it, it eventually gets to darkness. But what's interesting here is if, if you know orbs, you know, you know these, uh, uh, some photographs, you capture these little flares, and they're either accidents or they're spiritual beings. But I, I caught a little green orb here. Like, I think it's a, a being welcoming me to this cave. And there's, there's also a blue, I got a blue orb here. So these are either tricks of the camera or actual, you know, gifts of, if you believe in spiritual beings, showing up in photographs. <laughs> And this was uh, at the end of the journey. This is this past January. This is a real Mayan shaman. Uh, this is his hut in the jungles of the northern Yucatan. And I had um, an arrangement to have an afternoon session with him. And this is the shaman here. He lives near the village of Shumayal. And he has a, she's, this friend of mine is holding a stone idol. He found this stone statue in a cave. And the stone statue comes alive at night. It's his spiritual mentor. Well, he had a shaman who taught him how to be a shaman. This fella is 84 years old. Look, look how young he looks at 84. I mean, it's, it's pretty amazing. This guy's 84. He's, he looks younger than I am. <laughs> uh, but um, anyway, this, this shaman, if you want um, a summary, because I asked him, he gave uh, a basic healing ceremony with he, you know, the smudge, he did the smoke and the smudge ceremony. Then he also did a ceremony with uh, branches of leaves, sacred branches. Anyway, we talked about the 2012, the Mayan prophecies coming up. And real briefly, uh, he comes from the village of Shumayal. 1782, there was a Mayan shaman 
who had a vision quest in the same village that he came from. And his shaman, if you go back from his shaman to that guy's previous shaman to that guy's previous shaman, anyway, this shaman is a direct descendant of the shaman that had a vision quest in 1782 to first let the Western world know about the 2012 Mayan prophecies. And they were written down, uh, translated from Mayan to a Spanish priest in a book called the Shalom Balam, which means Jaguar priest. And that book was published in the late 1700s. And almost any book that you get at Barnes and Noble about the 2012 prophecies is because those writers read the Shalom Balam because those have the Mayan prophecy writings in them. And that's the first book from the Mayans to the Western world about the 2012 prophecies. This guy is a direct shamanic descendant of that shaman. But it was a real trip meeting this guy. The beautiful thing was how much love was emanating from this guy. Like when I first met him at his doorway, like there was this immediate hug. And, and I've met Native American shamans, and some are kind of more distant. Anyway, it depends when you meet shamans, how they, how they interact with you. This guy was like this just bundle of joy and this, I mean, the love emanating from this guy was incredible. And anyway, he said, don't worry, the, the whole thing, some, there's, there's two predictions for the 2012 prophecies. One is, you know, cataclysms, earthquakes, floods, uh, volcanic activities, disasters, cities wiped out, plagues. He says, no, don't worry about that. It's not gonna happen. There might be a few tremors here and there. But he says, trust me, from his shamanic tradition, uh, it basically represents a shift in consciousness. And this is what the Mayans meant in the 2012, December 21st prophecies. It's the end of a cycle of their time. And on December 22nd, it's not the end of the world. It's the beginning of their next cycle of Mayan time periods. And if you know anything about Bakhtuns and Katuns, there's a whole complex system of Mayan calendars. The time goes on after December 21st. It's just like going from 1999 to 2000. You know, it's, it's a different millennia. And so he said it represents a change in the time counting, but time continues, but it represents a shift in consciousness, much like we're going from the age of Pisces to the age of Aquarius. And so he said the key thing is a few months before and a few months after December 21st, if you're practicing a spiritual discipline, and this was translated from Mayan to English for me, but he said if, if you're practicing a spiritual discipline, the, the veil between the physical world and the spiritual world is going to gradually get thinner after December 21st, 2012. There, there's going to be opportunities for people practicing a spiritual discipline or practicing a meditation to get more in touch with their spiritual side. And that also it re represents globally over a period of years. It won't be immediately noticeable on December 22nd, but it, it represents like a paradigm shift in global consciousness. You know, much like the 60s, sort of we had a big shift and then whoops, Vietnam War nailed it. Uh, but there'll, there'll be a shift in consciousness where people even in organized religion will get more into spiritual disciplines and that there should eventually, within five or 10 years after 2012, there's gonna be more harmony among nations and also more harmony among religions. But that more people are gonna be pulled to the uh, metaphysical side, or no, the mystical side of their religion. You know, the Sufis will get more into Sufism. The Buddhists will even practice more meditation. But he said people worldwide will get more into the actual vision quest aspect of the spiritual journey. And so he says it represents a great opportunity for everybody. And so with that, I'll close the, uh, um, the lecture here. I know this was a little bit. <laughs> well, one, okay, one. Yeah, one, one thing before I, I answer questions is I really encourage people 
Uh, and I think everybody in this room, you were pulled here, you know, MUFON is a group that is pulled to the mystical and the paranormal, and there's a whole mystery to crop circles, UFOs, et cetera. But I think everyone in this room is pulled here because of a spiritual journey. And so what I encourage everyone is whatever path you're on, you know, follow your heart, follow your spiritual journey, whether it's Native American, whether it's Buddhist, whether it's Hindu, if you're into the Kabbalah, you know, get into the Kabbalah if you're Jewish. <laughs> uh, you know, follow the mystical path because I really encourage everyone to follow their, and your heart will guide you to your spiritual path. But I encourage everyone to pursue your own personal spiritual journey because it's different for everyone. But I think it's important at this time that we make an effort to really travel and do vision quests, pursue our own spiritual path. Okay, questions, yes, uh, that gentleman had first, yes. You made a lot of references with your, with all these uh, great sites, pyramids out there in Peru, all these great wonders of work to the people of Atlantis. Were, were they a spiritual people or were they genealogically a group of people? Can we go there and travel there today? Where is this? It's, it's a good question. It's a good question because- Matthew if you do about her, she yeah. Was, she, that talks about the Atlantis people and the Aryan nation. Uh, I don't know if you know, Yeah, she gets a little bit yeah, weird, weird into the whole Aryan thing. One of her religions, and, and there were some references to Atlantis. Can we go there and visit? I mean, where is the civilization? Who are the descendants of these people? Um, it's, here, it's a good question. Um, Madame Blavatsky, uh, she wrote a really great book in the 1920s called Isis Unveiled. If you're interested in what Madame Blavatsky wrote about, she's in the Theosophical Society. But basically, my understanding, because I've asked my spiritual teacher that question, you know, and what I think is, well, if you know about the Akashic Records, there, there are, if, if you manage to have a vision quest and leave your body astrally, if you get into the astral realms, and there, there's a difference between uh, floating above your body. When you first get out of your body, and, and I've had it happen, it, it's an unusual kind of freakish experience because you, you realize, wow, I'm a spiritual being. It's for real. I'm floating above my body. Hey, look, there it is. Wow. Um, so there's, there's sort of a difference between the beginning stages of floating out of your body astrally or etherically and then going to astral realms where I think the history, if you want to make a connection to Atlantis, it's in the past because that civilization, I believe they were physical beings of a sort, but they were kind of, uh, yeah, they were at a higher, they vibrated at, yeah, at a higher frequency. And so I think the people of Atlantis, if this is 10,000 or 20,000 years ago, they could morph between the physical and the spiritual much more easier than we could, where they could travel astrally uh, much, much more constantly every day. Um, so to answer your question, I, I think the beings in Atlantis existed as physical beings and astral beings, but, but they, were, they were vibrating at a higher frequency. And you can get in touch with them if you're lucky enough to get, and, and you gotta, it's either by grace or vision quest, or you have to pursue it in meditation. If you're lucky enough to get out of your body astrally, but what, what happens is there's a sound and a light experience at certain stages of astral, uh, being out of your body astrally. The initial stage is you float above your body, you float above your house. Shirley MacLaine kind of floated off to uh, the moon. She, she actually floated above the earth. Um, so there's, there's a stage where you're floating above your body or above the earth, but then, then there's this, ro this roar. There's a huge wave of sound and light and you burst through actually into these astral realms that, that are equivalent when you pass through the tunnel of light, when you pass from the physical to the spiritual, you know, the tunnel of light. So if you're lucky enough to get pulled into the astral realms, then you'll understand Atlantis is what I'm saying. So to, to truly understand Atlantis, you have to have that breakthrough in consciousness or astral projection.
My name is Jan Harzant. I'm the executive director for MUFON. We are a scientific research organization that basically collects sighting reports from the public and then goes and investigates them. Our mission statement as an organization is the scientific study of UFOs for the benefit of humanity. And we have three primary goals. We investigate UFO reports, we promote research into the UFO subject, and we educate the public on our findings.